Welcome to It's a New Day. My name is James Young. Today, my guest is... Mike Campbell. Unique fair. Please, Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm an independent contractor. Actually, um, I claim the title of Youth Development Specialist, and um, some of the programming, types of programming that I do are rites of passage, African-centered rites of passage, and mentoring with African-American males. Is this one of your students? Is this one of the This is one of my students. This is one of the participants in the Rites of Passage program. He's been through a couple of retreats, one last year, and he actually served as a peer leader this year for the retreat and the 12 week after school program as well. Um, please tell us about the program and Oh, I didn't I didn't mention I also teach African American studies okay. part-time at uh, Monroe Community College. Very good. Um, the Rites of Passage program, as you know, there are a lot of ways for young men and young women to engage in negative rites of passages, uh, joining gangs, uh, smoking cigarettes, uh, experimenting with drugs and alcohol, uh, premarital sex. And one of the things that we found is very important for young people, especially in the times that we live in now, is identifying what the positive rites of passages are for them, getting a driver's license, graduating from high school, uh, buying your first car, getting your first job. So we focus on what it takes for young people to become successful adults and help them understand what their responsibilities are to their families, to themselves, and to their communities as well. Now you might say, why do I do this? Well, I think you kind of know a little bit about it because you and I both were involved in the Soul Brothers Center back in the 60s. But I was a wayward youth. Um, I got into a lot of trouble and I joined gangs and um, I was arrested <clears throat> and I got into trouble. Although I did graduate high school on time, I did have some difficulties and it took a lot of mentoring and a lot of uh, sponsorship from other men in the community to help me become successful. As I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but I grew up in a single parent family. So a lot of the programs that we initiate and the mentoring that we do is uh, evolved around providing support and mentoring to males and females of African descent, particularly males right now. We can definitely see the need for a program like this. Do you want to go into a little bit of the history of why we're in this situation? Well, I mean, there, there's a lot of data. Uh, when, when you say this situation, um, I think about it in terms of uh, what's impacting young adults becoming adults right now. I think there's a lot of factors that are impacting that process. Primarily, uh, we live in an, an information society now. Things are a lot more accessible. We have the internet, everybody has cell phones. I mean, there's a lot more permissiveness with what you can see on television. I mean, people, young people watching TV today see something like 40,000 incidents of violence during the course of a two-hour program. I mean, that's just the nature of our society. And I think we're living in an age where the two-parent family has kind of gone by the wayside. In the 1970s, up until the 1980s, over 80% of African Americans were in two-parent families. After 1980, that, that percent has dropped to 49%. We're seeing a breakup of the American family, the black American family, but it's true across the board, not just in African American families. This is a phenomenon that's affecting United States society as a whole. Going through the program and being a young man, um, I'm quite sure that there has to be a lot of pressure from your peer group. What would make you uh, decide to live and beside the, uh, the boundaries of being responsible and getting an education when there are so many young people right now that just feel so hopeless, what is giving you hope? Uh, these types of programs have given me hope because I've seen that with you, by doing positive things, you can have a positive effect. While I think that a lot of youth, a lot of youth in, um, in Rochester and in the country itself have a lot of bad role models, I have people like Elder Campbell to be a role model for me. I look up, look up to them. I see that you have quite a bit of data there. You want to go <laughs> into... Uh, well, I, I want to I respond again okay. to the question of um, why we do rites of passage programming. <clears throat> and I'm quoting this from uh, Paul Hill, who's a uh, director of a rites of passage program in Cleveland, Ohio. They do rites of passage programming in the school with 5th, 6th, and 7th graders in, Ohio, in Cleveland, Ohio. But he, he, he wrote an article called Harvesting New Generation, 
New Generations, Afrocentric Rites of Passage by Paul Hill. And what he says is, the much quoted and overused African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child, is based on an assumption that the village is healthy. Exactly. And right now, a lot of the villages that our children are growing up in are not healthy. Exactly. And in essence, what rites of passage programs do, and mentoring programs, and other kinds of youth development programs do, is provide a healthy village for young people to develop in. And that's why it's so important. The village itself is not as healthy as it could be or should be right now. Now, how do we make the village healthy? Um, I'm assuming the programs, the things that you're doing, um, this is what the mentoring program, this is what the rites of passage would be doing, hopefully maybe um, helping young men understand what it is to be a man. Uh, if there's no man in the household, getting young men to understand the responsibilities of being a, a man. Absolutely. Um, if we look at the elements of a rites of passage program, what we're talking about is <clears throat> the first element is elders, caring adults that are providing mentoring and guidance to young people. The second element is a sacred space, a special place that these young people come to on a, for a designated time each week, each month, whenever the designated time may be, and it's a space that's dedicated for them. They can decorate it the way they want to. They can talk about, they're free to talk about what they want to there. It's a sacred space that they have for their own whenever they come there. The third element is initiates, male and female participants. The fourth element is challenges to the youth, challenge them to be all they can be. We do um, a number of different projects that are challenging both academically and some of them even physically. Um, for instance, we do a, um, a, a budgeting exercise where young people talk about what kind of lifestyle they want to live, what kind of cars they want to drive, and begin to realistically look at how much money that would cost them and what kind of a, a career they would have to engage in to be able to afford that lifestyle. And then we take it even a step further. They have to go out and research what colleges offer those careers. What does it take to get in those colleges? What do your SAT scores have to be? What kind of courses should you take in high school to prepare you for that? So we begin looking at what your life is going to look like 10, 15, and 20 years from now right away and begin to put together a plan so you can be successful in reaching that goal. That aligns with of how we can prepare young people for life through the education system, but developing an educational system that fits their particular lifestyle, the things that they're interested in, because I think that that's what's failing in the education system now, is that they've developed a system that they believe that every, that's supposed to fit everyone. And because the sheer nature of us being individuals, that that's literally impossible. And that has been the cause of a tremendous fallout from the education system, why young people have become so disengaged. Understanding young people being disengaged, getting them to understand the hardcore realities of life, does this help put them back on the track? Does this get them to see once they go through that when they say, okay, I want to live in this kind of house. I would like to drive this kind of car. I would like to be able to have this kind of career. Does this give them a greater focus on now what it takes to get to being those places? And one other part, does it also help them develop a sense of delayed gratification? Two-part question. The first, um, the first part I want to answer is um, what young people get out of the exercise and what we find when we get feedback from, from students is that they, they come to the realization that there is something between being uh, Ted Turner rich or movie star or entertainer rich and being on welfare. There, is a, there are a vast amount of jobs in between those two poles. And a lot of times, young people don't understand that an engineer makes pretty good money. Uh, a computer operator makes pretty good money. A nurse makes pretty good money. Working in construction, working as a plumber, working as a, an electrician. There are a lot of jobs between being, being poor and being, living in poverty around welfare and being, being rich. And that's, those are the kind of things that we want students to understand, a realistic look at what can I be in life and how do I get there? 
because I don't think a lot of students understand that if you, if you go to a, an elementary school right now and you ask third, fourth, and fifth graders, what do you want to be when you grow up? A lot of students will say, I want to be a football player. I want to go to the NBA. Oh, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. And while those things are attainable, if a student tells me he wants to be a doctor and he's in the fifth grade and he doesn't have A's in science and math, and he has D's and E's and F's in science and math, what I say to him is, you know, your behavior doesn't show me you want to be a doctor. You know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we have to be realistic about what we tell children and be realistic about helping them understand what it takes to attain these goals. And there are a lot of goals that come that, that are in between being a doctor or a lawyer and being on welfare. So I think that's the thing that, that students get from it, that, oh, I could actually be a plumber. Oh, I could actually be a nurse. Oh, I could actually be an electrician. And maybe that's something that they never thought about before. So it's kind of like an awakening for them. And they helping them understand how to get access to resources to make those things happen for them. The other question, mm -hmm. delaying gratification? Definitely, because during the course of the program, we're constantly delaying gratification. We're teaching young people discipline. We're teaching young people how to understand how discipline helps them. Um, our program oath that the young people say when they come to each meeting talks about discipline, achievement, and understanding. And I, I don't mean to put Unique on the spot, but I was going to ask Unique to tell you to share with you the Rites of Passage program oath. Rites of Passage program oath. With sincere humbleness, gratitude, and love, I take this oath of loyalty through dedication, discipline, understanding, and achievement to do all that I can in the way that I can to develop myself and my people. I accept my role given by my ancestors, and I promise not only to help my people but to teach them to help themselves. I recognize my family as the smallest example of our nation and my parents as the authority of our house. I pledge to keep this oath of commitment for as long as the sun shines and the water flows. How does that help you in everyday life with your peers when you're walking home and you're seeing young men out there doing the things that they do? Um, when you're seeing young men where it appears that their lifestyle may be greater than yours, uh, how do you deal with the fact of knowing that this is what you believe and know inside. But now you're still a young man and there's temptations and things out there. Is this strong enough for you to resist those temptations? Is this oath strong enough to hold you from going in the other direction? With the program itself, with the oath, it gives me, if I have a goal, if I have a goal in mind, such as like, he's, like Elder Campbell said, if I wanted to be a football player, then um, I would make sure that I have that goal, what I need to do to get, obtain that goal and then work towards getting that goal. I've interviewed a young person the, um, just last week. And one of the things that she shared with me is that there is a sense of hopelessness among young people that they feel that it's, it's as if life is beyond their control they feel that there are no more causes to fight for. Um, they feel that if Martin Luther King couldn't do it, that they wouldn't be able to, to do anything. Just this sense of hopelessness. But listening to you and the oath that you've taken and in being involved in this program, it seems like you and this program are creating hope. Uh, that's our job to educate people to show them that there is hope because as long as there, as long as you have your choice, you can create it. I want to come back to this because I think that this is the overall impact of when you're doing something successfully, when you're moving something from a negative state into a positive state. So I I know and feel that the program is intact, and this is something that we need to be pursuing throughout this entire community. I want to stop for just one moment and we'll come back, but I want to show the negative aspects that if we don't have a rites of passage, that if we are not saving young men like you need, let's show the other side and let's show the negatives of what could happen to a community or what has been happening to this community. Uh, and I'm talking about the negatives of drugs, alcohol, mm. unwanted pregnancies, prison. Mm. Let, let's talk about that when we don't have these types of things in a community. Um, 
it's, it's overwhelming sometimes because unfortunately the media uh, focuses on the negativity that comes out of the black community. And, and it's not just the black community, but you know, negativity sells papers and it's, you know, it, it's media hype. Before I get into that, I, I want to just say a little bit about how we started this and who supports okay. what we're doing, if mm -hmm. that's okay. Mm -hmm. About 12 years ago in 2000, my wife and I went to a, an African-American Rites of Passage retreat in Florida. And this is the first time we've been exposed to the information, African-centered Rites of Passage and that kind of stuff. Both of, us are, are, both of us are black history buffs. But I came away from the conference um, feeling uplifted. And there was um, a man was there, a director of a local not-for-profit organization, Ron Thomas from Baden Street Settlement was there, and he saw the closing ceremony. And him and I talked about it afterwards, and we decided to, uh, we wanted to, I wanted to get involved and he wanted to get involved. So we partnered and we developed a program and brought it to Baden Street Settlement. And I actually ended up going to work for Baden Street Settlement for about six years, but he, he had the insight to see that having something African-centered for young people where you had a big ceremony for them, which is what we do, we have a big closing ceremony or a crossing over ceremony where they, they shed their old habits ceremonially and they embrace the new and they ask the community to accept them and then the community back on the road to adulthood, to manhood and womanhood. So that was the first place that we began doing it at and I eventually, Baden Street Settlement paid for my training to be trained as a Rites of Passage elder. During the course of this, I began doing research about rites of passage. And I'll tell you about one piece of research I found. It was a seven-year study with um, 40 residents in a foster care home, 40 boys, 40 black boys in a foster care home. <clears throat> During the course of the rites of passage program, these guys improved their reading scores, improved their mathematics scores, and improve their social skills greatly over a, or a seven year period. That was the only longitudinal study I, I, I found. But other studies have proven that um, introducing African history, something they can be proud of about their culture and their heritage, ancient African history and current African history, inventions and contributions of Africans and you know the, the ancient stuff, is uh, we, we always want to look at that because we had great civilizations, great kingdoms and great inventions then as well. But these things increase self-esteem in young African-American boys and girls like nothing else does. So we looked at that information and Baden Street Settlement and Ron Thomas, they saw that, that was, these things were valuable and we implemented it there at Baden Street and we tried a lot of things with it. And I have students that come back now who are in college or have graduated from college that went through these programs with us and they're, they're doing very well. But I wanted to add that and, and, and mention that it's been supported by a lot of people and it's been supported because in these neighborhoods especially where Baden Street is located at 50 percent unemployment rate 60 percent rate high school dropouts less than 25 percent of black males graduating from high school less than 40 percent of black males entering into college at the even at the junior college level so you see those things going on and it, it makes people say well what can we do how can we have a better impact other than just rolling out basketballs. Because we can do tutoring, we can do uh, job readiness, but what, what the research is showing is that to build self-esteem, African-centered rites of passage, giving young African-Americans a piece of their history that they can be proud of and they can hang on to and say, well, hey, I didn't read that in my book in school because as we all know, the public, um, <coughs> excuse me, the public school system does not do a good enough job of educating African-Americans about their history and culture. Do you believe that through the historical aspects of learning about oneself that this has relevance in today's world? The reason why I ask you this is because my daughter, she believes that we're talking about ancient stuff, that this is stuff in the past, and she feels that this has no relevance whatsoever in her life. How do we get young people to realize how relevant this really is? I, you know, that's a question I, I often ask myself. Am I, am I giving students enough? I think it has to be a variety of things. You can talk about ancient African civilizations. You can talk about Africans being first to invent this or 
first to uh, develop certain processes. And you can talk about the richness of the continent of Africa, but I think at the end of the day, what makes people pay attention is something that interests them. Right? And, and sometimes you have to keep giving them information until, they find, until you find out what that is. I have one daughter who's, um, I have one daughter who um, is an African history buff. She changed her major in college three times from communications to French and then finally to African American history because she took a course with an instructor at Brockport State University who she was just very impressed with his knowledge of ancient Africa. And not only his knowledge of ancient Africa, but when you're talking about ancient Africa, people think the only thing that existed there was slavery. There was nothing there before colonization and before the Atlantic slave trade began. And there's a rich history, the Western Sudanic empires, Sangha, Mali, Timbuktu, the Eastern empires, Ethiopia, Nubia, Moro, uh, and of course, ancient Egypt, which is in Africa. And people, you know, they want to, you know, people, what have you believe? You can ask students today, where is Egypt at? And some people will say, ooh, I, you know, I think it's in, uh, I think it's in Asia. You know, you have to remind people, no, it's, it's actually in Africa. How does this reflect in um, with the social conditions that we were talking about earlier? If if we don't have programs like this, what are the what are the numbers of of how we're losing young people to the criminal justice system? Just well, as you said, yeah, um, go ahead. if I may make a comment on that, I can say that. Um, usually, if you don't have these types of programs, the only role models you would have would be the people who, who in these neighborhoods would be being successful, but they wouldn't be being successful legally. And because they, um, young people, they want to have the fast car, they want to have a good house and a good life, they want to have that, and they, don't, they wouldn't know about any of the other ways to do that legally. So more people would go into illegal businesses. On that note, but what are the possibilities, or just from your own perception, if young people had an opportunity to get jobs and to do better, do you think that they would or do you think that they would rather still just hang out on the street corner? I, I like to believe that young people, if the opportunities were there, they would do better. The reasons why they're doing what they're doing now is because of basic survival mode. You're young, is, is that a correct uh, assumption? Uh, I can't completely disagree because I can't speak for the entire, um, yes, entire teenage, teenage, all teenagers. But I can say that I think that a major problem is that even though they are there, people don't really know how important they are because in the communities, people don't have a, people don't really realize how important education is sometimes because you don't really see it that much in the communities that you that you're raised in. And at the same time, even though you have these resources around, usually. A lot of people don't know they even exist because I do a lot of stuff within the community and the only reason I know about them was by complete chance because my mom worked here and she found out about it or that a location and someone gave me a flyer about this or that. So I think media should focus more on these positive things to show mm -hmm. that there are things in the community that are worth um, looking into. Did you want to add something on to that? Well, I, just, I just wanted to say that a lot of times um, young people, as I said earlier, when you talk about delaying gratification, to get a job as an engineer or a, a pharmacist or a nurse or a doctor or a computer operator, computer programmer, you have to delay gratification. It takes some special training. It takes some college education. It may take an internship. It may take, um, you know, you, you may fail at first and have to pick yourself up and start over again. And that, that ability to delay gratification is not what's talked about by by young people who are selling drugs or involved in street and street uh, drug activity and trying to make fast money. It's about fast cash. And that's not what happens when you want to have a real career. It's t you have to delay the gratification. It takes time. You have to make decisions. And also, one of the things that we talk about a lot is what are our values? What do we value? We do a couple of values workshops with young people, help them understand that if you say you value loyalty, but nobody can trust you to tell you anything. You betray a secret every time somebody tells you what, then you're not telling the truth. You, value, you really don't value loyalty. You have to really help people, help young people, help young people identify what they value and teach them what values are going to get them what they really want in life. That's a very good question because, or a very good point, brethren. And the question is, we have such um, 
bad perception of what loyalty is. We mm. think by not telling on someone that there's some sense of mm. loyalty there. Um, we, we think that um, we could see somebody breaking our next door neighbor's house and not say a word because somehow we have this sense of loyalty that to say something about this somehow we're looked at in a negative light. We violate some. We, yeah, we violate some, code. exactly. Yeah. So, and 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 even with myself, but in your peer group, there's a sense of loyalty that we have to the group of people that we associate with, good or bad. And I think we've um, we've taken the word loyalty, and we've given it different meanings. And so now when we're talking about loyalty. Loyalty within the sense of what? Well, loyalty to a cause greater than myself. Mm. Loyalty to the uplifting of my people and my community. You know, one of the phrases that used to irritate me when I was doing programming in organizations was to hear teenagers say, or even in the schools, because you hear young children say it too, uh, snitches get stitches. and. A lot of times, people don't even know what a real, what a snitch is, what somebody, what an informer is, you know. And my understanding of it is that that's someone who commits a crime with someone else, say, unique in myself, and then I get caught, and to minimize my punishment, I tell on unique. But, it, but there's a couple of factors here that are different from telling on somebody doing something in your community that's hurting your community. The difference is I was involved in a crime, so I'm trying to get myself some leniency, okay? <laughs> but telling on somebody who's doing something negative in my community and hurting my people, that's a whole different thing, and that I should do that. If I know who, who killed somebody, I should come forward and I should help the police. The problem is that African American people are afraid of law enforcement, and the history of our relationship with law enforcement has not always been good. And I don't have to give you a whole lot of cases, but I can just say Rodney King, okay? But our relationship has not been good. And there is an issue in our community of um, racial profiling and of police brutality. That, I mean, that's a whole other show, I, I, I would suggest. But, but those are the factors are, are around those issues. You know, this program that um, Unique came through was sponsored by an organization here called Wilson Commencement Park. Yeah. Um, Rod Cox Cooper is the executive director and um, Wanda... Oh my goodness, I can't think of Juan's last name. Uh, Juan Acevedo. Yes. Yeah, I have mm -hmm. to pronounce that. And Juan Acevedo uh, support this program because they have programs within their agency where they help people who are in need, people who have some problem with getting their lives back on track, and they provide all kinds of support for them over there. And they see the value in programs like this for young people. And fortunately, they open the program up citywide. So any a uh, young person in the city could enroll or apply to the program. But those are the things that we see on a daily basis in these communities. And, you know, you, you asked me a question earlier on, I know when we were talking on the phone before I came on the show, you were asking me, uh, I think you mentioned something about why I do this. For, for me, why, why wouldn't I do this? I, mm -hmm. I feel like everybody should be doing this. I feel like there's, there aren't enough of us to handle all of the... Uh, the volume of what's needed in our community. I feel like our community is in crisis right now and that we need people doing things to help young people especially. I, I totally agree with that because um, as I said a couple of weeks ago, I did a show on finding out what are the needs, what are young people saying that their needs are. Mm. And I feel that we as, a, as adults we have done young people a, a grave disservice. Mm. We have not been there. Unfortunately, we allow things to happen with inside this community that should not have happened. We stopped teaching men or young boys how to be men. Mm. Um, we allowed other things to come in and to give young people the image of what they now believe they should be. I think now we are finally realizing the destruction of this, and it's a beautiful thing to see us reclaiming 
our young people again because that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at that we are now reclaiming our young people going into the streets and bringing them back into some level of consciousness and taking them out of the things that they are doing. Which brings me into segueing back again. If a program like this does not exist, Let's talk about the tramps that are out there. I saw that you brought some material in there oh, that uh, talked about the new yeah, Jim Crow. I, and from well, the conversation that we had, uh, you were saying that there are young men going to prison and in greater numbers than we've ever imagined before and how this is becoming the new slavery. Let's talk about some of those issues when we don't involve youth in these particular in other, I want to be able to show, we either do this or we lose them to something else. The statistics are alarming. And actually, um, between 1980 and 2000, the United States went from 300,000 people in prisons and jails in this country to over 2 million people mm -hmm. being incarcerated. And um, I mean, you can attribute some of it to the war on drugs, certainly. Um, and for African-American males, it's, it's, it's even worse because you're talking about blacks in this country are 13% of the population, but African-American African males are 45% of the prison and jail population. Um, the reason I brought the book, um, Michelle, Michelle Alexander's new book called The New Jim Crow, is because she highlights some things about this phenomenon that, I mean, just the casual observer might overlook. And one of the main things she talks about is that um, during Jim Crow, laws were enacted that impacted the newly freed African Americans to keep them in their place in the South, so to speak. And some of those laws were more than four people couldn't gather together. Um, you could be arrested if you didn't have a job, that you could prove you had a job. Um, the vagrancy laws in the South. And she talks about the new Jim Crow now being the war on drugs. Um, African-American communities where drugs are proliferated at or where there's a high concentration of drug activity, open-air drug activity and drug use being profiled and um, the, the United States prison industrial system being a new form of slavery. And she says that because when you look at what happens to people after they've been incarcerated, ex-felons or ex-convicted uh, ex, uh, ex-felons when they come out of jail they don't have any rights the same as uh, African-Americans didn't have during, Jim, during the Jim Crow period in this country. Uh, when you look at a person who comes out of prison, they are not allowed to vote. Uh, it's very hard to get a job. It's hard to get loans. Uh, housing discriminates against them. And it's legal to discriminate against convicts, ex-convicts, because of their, their, their status as convicted felons in this community. So that's what she's talking about because the large numbers of African American males who are being imprisoned in this country. And she talks a lot in the book about uh, it not being happenstance and not being normal institutional racism that we know exists and that is, you know, where certain things are being done to try to eradicate those things. But the book is a good book. Matter of fact, um, she talks about the war on drugs is creating an underclass in America. It makes black men second-class citizens, and as I said earlier, it discriminates against ex-convicts in housing, public benefits, employment, education, voting, oh, and jury service. And she, she talks about the war on drugs being the driving force behind the escalating incarceration rates in America. Drug arrests have tripled since 1985. And as I said earlier, between 1980 and 2000, jail and prison populations in the United States swelled from 300,000 to over 2 million and African-American males are bearing the brunt of the war on drugs, according to Michelle. And the data she uses is from the United States Bureau of Criminal Justice Statistics, which is a database I'm very familiar with being a graduate in a criminal justice program here. But, um, you know, the number of, um, of uh, African-American male prisons per 100,000 in the United States is 6,838. If you round that up, that's 7,000 people. Now remember, we're 13% of the population. And you look at the number of white male prisoners per 100,000 U.S. males, it's 990. Hmm. You know, we're seven times, we're incarcerated at a rate seven times more than white males are. Hmm. I mean, for me, it just says that um, there's got to be more to it than we're committing more crimes. I mean, I would agree with Michelle Alexander. 
we're only 13 percent of the population how could we possibly be possibly be 45 percent of the prison population and committing six times more crimes or being incarcerated at a rate six times greater than our counterparts i mean it's just it's you know the numbers begin to make you start to think and i mean i'm sure there are other vari variables that could be factored into that equation but if you don't get involved in a program if you don't have some kind of positive mentoring in your life and you don't make some some good decisions that's where you can end up very easily how does this resonate with this information how does this resonate with you do you see that if you're not on this side that you could be part of the numbers that he's talking about being in prison um, do you see the impact that partic participating in these negative activities of how going to prison, that this could change the outcome of your life, the very things that you do, does this really matter? Does this, is this something that, that you can visually see? Is this something that you can experience? From the point of not just saying, okay, I'm listening to him, and I'm going to believe what he's saying is true, but I mean, do you truly feel that if you don't live this way and go and be on the negative side of life and end up in prison, do you believe that how this could destroy your life to, to looking at doing the self-improvement, delayed gratification, improving your status so you can move forward when you're making that choice? How does this all balance with inside of you? Well, with these programs and all, I'm glad that I'm on the other side of things. So when I'm around other people, I feel like I might have a positive influence on them. So when I'm on, if I was on the opposite side of things and I was going to jail and getting in trouble and getting in fights at school or something like that, I think I would have a negative influence on all the people that would be around me. I mean, I'd even have a, ne a negative effect on adults because that would just strengthen the youth are all bad stereotype. So. Mm. Can I, can I ask you, mm -hmm. how, do you, how, do you, how do you feel when you're interacting with your peers that you know are involved in negative things or aren't, um, or aren't doing things that we would consider to be uh, headed in the right direction? How do, how, how, do you act, how do you react to your responsibility to be a positive role model? How do you react to that? I realize that you can't, tell, you can't walk up to someone and tell them you need to get your life straight because... They, they have to do that by themselves. So be, by being the best role model I can be for people younger than me, older than me, and that are about my age, I feel like I can have an effect on them through that. I, I, I hear you saying that, and I, the reason why I, I'm questioning you in, to the point that I'm doing is because of the responsibility. I know that there's got to be a great deal of responsibility placed on your shoulders. Um, that there's a saying that ignorance is bliss, meaning that when you're ignorant, I mean, you're, you're very happy. <laughs> Life is fun, mm. and it, because you're so ignorant, that, that's what makes it blissful. But when mm. you become intelligent, it's no longer that, those games anymore. And a program like this is making you intelligent, it's making you become aware. It is making you see the other side of life, that if you don't do the right thing. And being young, I, I know that it's easy to do the wrong thing and hard to do the right thing. And just once again, is this program strong enough? Is, this, is your belief system in this program strong enough that will continue to make you go the opposite direction when negative things are presented to you? Uh, yes, I do believe the program does keep me on the right track because, that, because not only do I have the program, I have people who have shown me that the program does work. I have Mr. Campbell, I have other, other older men in the community, I have um, older women in the community, and they show me that this stuff works. So being on the better side of things does show to work, does work out, which most people, most people have a misconception that if you do things the good way or by the book, it takes years and years and years, but with the people that I know, I have proof that it doesn't take years and years, and I have, and that I can do stuff without having to do it illegally. Why don't we have more programs like this? Why aren't we shouting this from the rooftops? How come we don't have 
whatever the name of the school would be, whatever the name of this building would be, where we just have so many young people coming through the doors. Why aren't we? Well, you, you, I, 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 would, I would not say that there aren't positive programs in our community. No, no, but uh, I mean, but with the results that you see, that you know that are coming from this program, where is the funding for more programs like this? Why isn't this more relevant than buying basketballs? Okay. Well, I think I, I, that's, that's a good question, but I think we need all of it. And I think that um, what we're doing with this program is not unique in the sense that young people are being successful in the program. And there are other programs that are doing different things that people are successful in as well. Um, there are programs at different organizations, Bay Street Settlement, City of Rochester, um, the Urban League of Rochester, Center for Youth Services. There are a ton of organizations in this community that provide services to young people. And what I think what works best is exposing young people to a variety of different kinds of, of youth development programs. <coughs> I don't think anything happens in a vacuum. I'm not saying that our Rites of Passage program is the be-all to end-all. What I am saying is that we know it's successful with African-American children because it teaches them about ancient African history and about African-American history, which provides a self-esteem booster to them. There are other programs that they do research on, but I don't think there's a lot of research on programs that work specifically with African-American children, and this is a program that does. I mean, that's been my experience. That's the research, also what the research shows us. Um, I wanted to mention that um, there are a couple of other initiatives. There's a program in Chicago, Illinois, called the Black Star Project. And the Black Star Project is the clearinghouse for initiatives for African-American youth. And they started a project about two months ago, and it, it ran through January and February. And it was called the Black Male Achievement Mentoring Initiative. And we held a mentoring initiative um, event here in Rochester at um, uh, the Stardust Ballroom at Edgerton Recreation Center back on February 29th and we had African males, young African American males and African American boys and African American men come together and we did a group mentoring session. And this was a suggested program as part of a national initiative. So we were part of 120 other cities in the United States that got involved in this effort on that during those two months. And those are the kind of things that are coming down the pipe that I think are very positive. The other thing that's going on right now is the, um, is the uh, Stop uh, Jim Crow uh, initiative, and it's also being sponsored by the Black Male uh, Achievement Mentoring Initiative out of the Black Star Project in Chicago. And what they, when which, what they talk about doing is help eliminate the new Jim Crow with thoughts and actions during March and April 2012. With more black men in jails and prisons than colleges and universities, it is time for the black male achievement movement to get to work. And one of the statistics, statistics that uh, Michelle Alexander threw out in her book was that there are more black men under correctional control right now, jail, prison, parole, or probation, than there were in slavery when the Emancipation Proclamation was issued in 1863. That's a, that's a pretty big statement. That's a pretty bold statement. That's kind of an indictment of what we're doing with, uh, with, with African American males. But they ask you to, during the months of March and April, for people in your city that want to get involved in this Black Male Achievement Mentoring Initiative, to host a reading circle for the new Jim Crow book at your church, your high school or college. There's a whole list of things that you could do to support this effort. And a couple of them I, I think are pretty good. Mentor youth in juvenile detention facilities. Uh, become a volunteer uh, to visit incarcerated young men and women in prisons and jails. Work to get records expunged for the formerly incarcerated, for those that had uh, YA offenses or juvenile offenses. Um, help returning citizens to find jobs. Speak to youth in schools about not becoming a part of the criminal justice system which is one of the strongest things that we do as mentors. We advocate for young men not to commit crimes. Don't go to jail. Don't get involved in the system to begin with. There are other ways. You know, if you look at your values, if you value freedom, then you won't commit crimes. I mm -hmm. mean, it's, it's, it's kind of logical, but it's, it's useful to have somebody help you begin to see that if you're young. Write a letter to, uh, to a person in jail or prison. Become a court watcher to ensure that black men and boys are being treated fairly by the criminal justice system. And, and it offers a phone number if you want to uh, be a servant leader and begin the initiative in your city. 
and that phone number is 773-285-9600. Okay. And I called them in February to get the packet. They have a kit that they send you out. I got a packet for the Black Male Achievement Mentoring Initiative. They send you a packet and tell you how to get organized. And you know, the biggest thing I had to do was find a place to hold the event at. But those are the kind of things that we can be doing to, um, you know, to, to fight back against some of the negative things that have happened to young people in our communities. What are the initiatives going to make black men stronger fathers? There, you know what? That's a good question. But um, there is a, um, well, I'll turn around here. There is a um, black parenting initiative that's being sponsored through the city of Rochester Office of uh, Youth Services. And they offer a 15-week uh, uh, black parenting training program for uh, fathers and mothers, but they have some good stuff in there for fathers, particularly young fathers. Um, there used to be a um, African-American um, fa uh, fathers uh, resource initiative here in Rochester. As a matter of fact, I um, uh, can't think of the guy's name now, but he died last summer. Oh, Todd Williams was the director of that program. and. Um, Tide actually died last summer, unfortunately, but that program uh, was spearheading initiatives for African-American males in the community. I, there may be other programs right now, but I'm not aware of them. But those are some of the things that we could begin to do. Okay. I think that that's a program that we desperately need to be able to start introducing to young black males at a very early age. Mm. Because, unfortunately, with young men, we're just thrown out into the world where we get our education of how to be a man at his on street corners, mm. locker rooms, or from someone who knows less than we do about being a man because there aren't enough men around to give us this good information. And I believe that this is part of the problem of why we see so many um, black men in prison is because they didn't have role models or father figures in their lives and we continue to keep producing this same particular problem. Um, as you know, uh, Dr. Clovis, um, out, or Professor Clovis, out at the Rochester Institute of Technology, he does a study that states that in their certain zip-coded areas, uh, here in the city of Rochester where there are no black men from the ages of 17 to 35. Um, that's because they're in prison. They're locked up or dead. Um, one of the things that I want to say about rites of passage programming and about mentoring initiatives is that we don't talk to, to young men a lot about being fathers, but we do talk to them about is their values. And if you, if you learn to have good values, then a byproduct of that is becoming a good father. But what we do talk about specifically is before you can be a father or be a parent, you need to be a man. You need to understand what that takes, what your responsibilities are to yourself and to the community. Secondly, that before you can be a father, you should be a husband. Because it takes two parents to raise a child successfully or you have a much better chance. I don't, I don't want to say it takes two to raise one because there are a lot of single parents who are doing a really good job with their young people. But it's, 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 it's better if you have two. I think, I think we all know that. And the third thing is that um, making a baby doesn't make you a father. It makes you a biological donor, basically. Uh, being a father takes a lot more, there's a lot more to it than you know, being involved in intercourse with a female. And those are important things to remember because if a young man understands that he needs to become a man first and a husband second and then become a parent, I mean, it, it, it minimizes the possibility of another child growing up without a father in his life and without parents who are actually engaged in the life of a child. It takes a lot of work to raise children. You know, a lot of people, um, I don't want to say a lot of people, but I think there's a misconception that, oh, well, you know, um, my parents, you know, they did this and, you know, if I do that, my kids are going to grow up successful. Times have changed. Between the time I grew up and, and when I'm raising kids, I have five children, the youngest of who is 26 now. Things were vastly different in our lives when my daughters and my sons were growing up than they were when I was growing up. We didn't have cable television. We didn't have the Internet. We didn't have this uh, vast instant media all around us 
where everything's at your fingertips and you get exposed to so much more. You get exposed to pornography, you get exposed to a lot more violence, you get exposed to a lot more crim criminality. There, was, there were uh, how-to um, uh, manuals on the internet about how to make bombs. I mean, look at the McVeigh incident in Oklahoma. I mean, they, they, that stuff didn't exist when I was growing up. So parents have a lot more challenges now than, than our parents, your, yours and my parents had. One of the things that I always talk about when people, when I start talking to people about youth development is I would love to see a Soul Brothers Center exist in Rochester right now. It's the place I used to go to when I was a teenager and <clears throat> Mr. Young actually was one of the, uh, the elder peer advisors there when I was going there. But um, I was involved in a gang and I got in trouble. And uh, because I got in trouble, I, you know, I had to go to this Soul Brother Center and um, I had to be involved in, a, in an activity. So the act, the, we had to take a class. So the class I took was broadcasting. And there was only one African-American uh, disc jockey in, in Russia at that time. The guy's name was Herm ha Herb Hamlet. He had a four-hour show once a week on WCMF. And he told us how to use appropriate diction, how to talk into the microphone, how to, uh, how to do ads on the air. And I loved that little class. And you know, I went there for about two years. But it was a place where it was safe. And we were allowed to have fun. We played pool, ping pong. You know, we laughed and joked, but when you were there, you couldn't fight or you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't come back. You couldn't fight, you couldn't come back. You couldn't threaten anybody. And you couldn't talk about, you know, I'm in this gang and my gang's better than yours. So there was no, no, no rivalry was allowed there. But it was a very positive, I'm, my, mem my memory of it may be faded by now, but I remember it to be a very positive place when I, when I, when I was a teenager. You know, I, I was going to ask you to talk about your past and a little bit more about who you are, mm. because I think there would be there will be people out there in the viewing audience, and especially young males that say, "Yeah, it's easy for you to talk about this now. You're mm. out at MCC doing this. You have this program. Your life is fine." Mm. But now, let's share a little bit of history about well, growing up. And I, I'll tell you, uh, I grew up in a single parent family. Uh, I didn't even meet my biological father until I was 12 years old. I think I shared this story with yeah. you guys. I met my biological father when I was 12. When I was born, he, he got in trouble before I was born. While my mother was carrying me, he got in trouble. He was 17 years old. And he, he had to go to the service to avoid going to jail. So he went to the Air Force. And while he was in the Air Force, he got in trouble smuggling drugs. And uh, they gave him, uh, I think, seven years in Leavenworth. And while he was, while he was serving the seven-year sentence in Leavenworth, he, would, he, he liked to gamble. He got involved in a, in a gambling, some kind of gambling game. I don't know if it was dice or cards, but there was some, you know, some disagreement. And him and another guy got into a fight and he killed the guy. So they added five years to a sentence, which you know gives you a total of the 12 years. And when I met him, I, I had no idea who he was. He knocked on our door one evening. I went to the door. I didn't know him. And I said, hey, Mom, there's some guy at the door. She went to the door, and they talked in low tones for a few minutes. Then she says, you know, grab a jacket. You're going to go for a walk with this gentleman. And I was like, OK. And while we're talking, he says, hey, you know, you don't know me, but I am, I, I am your father. And you know, I've been away for a long time. I don't know why nobody told you. or you know, I, I didn't know anything about, about him, you know, but uh, that's how I met him. And I met him when I was 12 years old, and he died when I was 18 mm -hmm. of a drug overdose when I was 18 years old. So I knew him for about six years. And if you, I mean, that, that's not like, a, 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 that's not the exception for a lot of, of, of black men. Exactly. That's not the exception. I mean, that's kind of commonplace for guys not to know who their father is and not, I began to examine that phenomenon as I got older and asking, well, hey, where's your father? Well, you know, I don't know who my father is even. Or my father, you know, he, he left us when I was young. Or some set of circumstances that young African-American men are growing up without fathers in the household. So that was, that was my, my personal experience with my father. And, you know, as I said earlier, I got into a lot of trouble when I was young. I got arrested a lot. I got in trouble all the time. And I didn't really stop getting arrested and getting in trouble until I actually got married in 1982. So the early part of my life I was, you know, constantly in and out of being arrested and getting in trouble. And, um, you know, since that time I've gone on to earn a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. But, um, you know, I, I grew up right in, this, right in the neighborhood. I, I lived right on 
right off Jefferson Avenue. I mean, you know, I saw I, I saw quite a bit as a young as a young person, not because um, my mother wanted me to. My mother worked evenings, so my mother went to work at three o'clock and then come home to eleven. I, you know, my brother and I, we were. I think I was about twelve when my mother. I was about maybe thirteen, fourteen. When my mother started working evenings. And I lived in a rough neighborhood. I, you know, I joined a gang for safety. You know. <laughs> so. I also wanted to mention your past, so people can see that because of your past, you don't have to be stuck there. That no, you can not at all. make something of your life. That you can turn your life around. And uh, just like with yourself, prior to developing the Soul Brothers, I had got myself in trouble. And during the 60s, this was, I found it to be an amazing time because I look at the 60s as an age of awakening. We were becoming aware of what Excuse it was me. to be black. Mm. Uh, we were coming into the knowledge of ourselves and which came about was the Soul Brother Center. And what we wanted to do is basically what your program is doing then we didn't have the richness, which I mm. believe that your program, because of the information today, the mm. desire was there. Mm. Our basic concept was to try to keep young men free. Um, this is, was the beginning of the scourge of drugs coming into our community. Yeah. And we were trying to keep the young people from getting involved into that uh, part of the 60s as well, was the drug culture. Everybody did drugs in one form. If nothing else, you experimented. And because of that, we were trying so desperately to stop young people from even experimenting, uh, seeing that life was much better than getting caught into that. And then we got caught up into something. The very thing that we were trying to prevent, uh, we got involved with, ended up happening anyway. And so one of the things that I want to say to young men is that we have to take the responsibility in reclaiming ourselves first, reclaiming our neighborhoods, reclaiming our families, because you're absolutely right. I can remember all of us growing up there when you asked the question, I mean, how many of us actually had fathers that, you know, that lived in the household? or actually knew their fathers, because like yourself, uh, I mean, my situation was even a little different because I was in a foster home. Mm -hmm. I not only didn't know my father, I didn't know my mother as well. Mm -hmm. So there laid a whole nother set of circumstances there. And so now one of the things that we have to be able to do is to really reclaim our lives, our self-worth, and know that we are somebody. We're almost out of time. Please, uh, Mike, tell us about the program, the name, phone number, how we can get people in touch with you, how we can start oh, getting more people sure, involved in the organization. Sure. Uh, the past two years, we've done rites of passage retreats with, through Wilson Commencement Park. They've sponsored the project for us. Um, I can be reached, or you can send an email to me at africanrights at gmail.com, that's A-F, R-I-C-A-N-R-I-T-E-S at gmail.com. Um, and any questions about how to get involved in a program or um, questions about what the program consists of and how you can get a student enrolled, uh, I can I be able to answer them through an email. Okay, very good. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank well, you thank so you much. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you, you so much. Time.